church. Praise the Lord. Getting better and better at setting up things. I got a mic holder now. Praise the Lord for that. Let me just adjust the camera a little bit better. Sunday. This is a Sunday that the Lord has made. Amen. Amen. Go to the power of prayer book. The abundant pardon. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mark 10, 47. The promise of God to all kinds of sinners are the same. God promise are fulfilled when sinners are repent and ask God for forgiveness. The praying sinner receives mercy because his prayer is grounded on the promise that if we confess our sins, God will forgive us and purify us. The remorseful one who seeks after God obtain mercy because there is a definite promise of mercy to all who seek the Lord's face. Prayer always brings forgiveness to the seeking soul. The abundant partner is dependent upon the promise made real by God's promise to the sinner. Lord, thank you for your promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from our unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. Church, my text today comes from give me a minute. I'm learning this new equipment. My text comes from Ezer chapter 3 verse 10 to 13. E-Z-R-A. The young man shouted while the old man wept. Because of the Israel refusal to abandon their idols and worship the one true God, they were chastised by the Lord and were taken away into captivity by the Babylonians. The captivity to last 70 years. Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 11 to 12. This 70 year period began in 605 BC when the Babylonians King Nebuchadnezzar invaded the subjecting, uh, subjecting Israel. Later in 5 86 BC after Israel rebelled against him Nebuchadnezzar peacefully completely destroyed Jerusalem the temple and all the temple furniture he also carried off all the treasures of the temple at that time for the next 70 years Israel lived in captivity without a temple and without the feasts church Sacrifice and rituals prescribed to the law. Cyprus, the Persian, overthrown the Babylonians in 539 BC and in 538 BC gave permission 
for the Jews to return to their homeland. Almost 50,000 Jews left Babylon and returned to Palestine. Three years later, in 535 BC, they laid the foundation for the new temple, thus ending the 70 years of, cap of their captivity. Our text records for us the laying of the foundation of the new temple. Church for many of the Jews present that day, it was a time of joy, of great joy. The Bible says they shouted aloud for joy. But others who were there that day could not shout about, about what they were seeing. Instead, the Bible says they wept with a loud voice. Why is it that one group is so excited and praising the Lord while the other group is sad and weeping? I believe the Bible holds the answer to that question. I also believe that by answering that question, we will also uncover some very valuable truths for our, for our church today. Today, as the Lord gives liberty, I want to preach on that subject, this subject, of this a thought. The young men shouted while the old men weep. God has something here for us in this passage. If we are willing to receive it today, the gospel of the past, what, what they remember, a group of men, of older men remembered the first temple. They remembered the gender, the gold, and the glory. They remembered the old days when the temple of the Lord was one of the wonders of the ancient world. They remembered a temple that if built today would cast multi -billions, cost multi-billions of dollars to build. They remembered a temple that housed the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. They remember that within their ark, that Ark were tablets containing the laws of, the, of God handed down to Moses. They remember the Saturdays. Glory could, could have filled the first temple, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 8 to 12. They remember the day when Solomon Temple was literally the house of God. What they realized, church, they understood that this new temple would never be the same. They could see that it would be similar, smaller. They knew that they did not have, have the resources to build it like it had, had been all those years ago. They realized that all the things that made the first temple precious, the ark and its contents, the mercy seat, the glory cloud, etc., were for, forever gone. This realization broke their hearts and they wept bitterly. Church, note this. There were many, there were many with us today. There are many with us today, church who remember the glory days of the church. They remember a time when the word of God and the house of God were held in high regard all day. They remember a time when the fear of God was on the community and, and even the lost respect, respected the things of God. They remember the day, church, when the pulpit and the pews were both filled with the Spirit of God. They remembered a time when God's presence and His power was manifest in the Lord's house as souls were saved. The saints shouted the victory and the church enjoyed God's great power. Those who remember those good old days look at the modern church with, the, with a broken heart. As they long for the things that have passed, there are many who are haunted by the ghosts of the past. I'm, I am not an old man. I do not remember many of those things I have heard about in stories, but my heart does ache for a return to those simple, those simply more powerful days. Even though I have 
never been in a real revival. I too am haunted by the ghosts of the past and pray for a return of those days of power and glory, the gifts of the present, what they remember. In that number, in that number were even more people who did not remember the first temple. They had no idea of what it ha what it had um, looked like, or of the glory that it had been in. All they remember was a life of captivity and bondage in the foreign land. No doubt, many of those people had been born during the time of Israel captivity, and all they could remember was their slavery. But they also remember how God in his power had delivered them from the bondage. They could not remember that first temple, but they were thankful for what they had, what they realized. These young people could not remember the old days, but they could see that a new day of opportunity had dawned for them, and they in, in, uh, embraced it wholeheartedly. These young people had no frame of reference concerning the old days, but they was excited about what God was doing in their day. Notice, note this, friends. It is easy to err or eat on either side of, of this thing. Some people are so caught up in the past that they cannot get excited about what God is doing in the present. Still, church, still, there are others who are so willing to embrace the newest trends and methods that, they're, that they forget about what God did and how he worked yesterday. The bottom line is this, church. The past is gone forever and we live in the present. We need to look back and glean what we can, can from days gone by. But we have to live in, in the here and, and now. Does that mean, church, that we have to change to fit in with the times? Does that mean that we need a new Bible? Does that mean that we need a, 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 a scroll a, or in favor or praise cause? Does that mean that we need to replace preaching with a worship drama? Does that mean that we must lower our standard to accommodate the world? Does that mean that we need to be more seeker friendly so we can attract the big crowds? The answer to all these questions is no. Church, what it does mean is that we mean that we need to look at how and where God is working today and be thankful for the opportunity he has given us in these days. Church, you see, we can become trapped in the past and totally miss what God is doing today. Or we can get so caught up in all the modern trends and methods that we fail to realize that God does not change. What he was doing in our great grandfather day. He is still doing today. How God saved souls then is still how he saved them today. Society has changed. The church has changed. The world, the world has, has changed. But God cannot and will not change church. Notice this right here. There, uh, notice this here, church. Here was the problem with both, with both of the viewpoints, church. Bear with me, I'm trying to just get, get an adjustment on this thing. Um, they both squandered the opportunity God gave them. You see, church, they laid the foundation for the temple. 
but the work was hard. For 15 years, they went about their lives, built their own houses, and did what they wanted to do. For 15 years, the house of the Lord stayed unfinished. All those who were looking back fondly failed to move forward in the things of God. All those who had been so excited about what God was doing in their day also failed to carry it out to completion. Do you see what I'm trying to get across? We can sit here looking back to the past, longing for the old days, dreaming of the way things were, and get absolutely nothing done for the glory of God. We can become all caught up in, uh, in the latest movie, book, or trend, and fail to do anything for the Lord. Either one is a shame, either one is a shame, a waste of time, and either one misses the whole point of our existence. We are not here to look back, church. We are here to jump on the latest bandwagon. We are here to join God in what he is not, he is doing in these days for the glory. What they should have done was to put their backs to the work at hand, rebuild the temple and get about the business of serving God. Instead, church, they were all sidetracked by their own little agendas. God helps us to do what we have been called to do. I cannot go back a hundred, hundred or two hundred years to the time of great revival in the church and live then. Neither can I nor will I embrace everything that is becoming, that is being promoted in this modern agenda. Here's what I can do. I can bow before the Lord, commit my life to Him, ask Him to, to show me what He wants to do to me, to do, want me to do, and get busy doing His will today, church. May we be careful to use the opportunity we have been given for the glory of the Lord while we still have time to do so. The glory of the promise. As I said 15 years ago, the work on the temple still had not been finished. God raised up the prophet Hagen and Zechariah to preach to the people. God used these men to stir up the people of Israel and to get busy and to get to work and get the work done. Now, church, this was a difficult time for both old people and for young people. Remember, the old people were sad because things were not like they used to be. The young people were being discouraged by the attitudes of the old people. In the midst of this tribe turmoil, God used the message of Hagar to bring hope and an enjoyment, encouragement to all the people of Israel. His message still gives hope to us in this day as well. We live in a day when many are discouraged and wonders about the relevance of the church in this modern world. Others wonder what the future holds for the house of God. I think Hagen was some words, has some words of comfort for all our hearts in this evening. The promise of his, of his presence. God says, this temple may not be a, be a great, as great as the first one. But I am still here with you. Friends, church, we have the same promise this evening. Things may not be like they used to be, but the same God who moves then is still with his people. Praise God, he still shows up from time to time. The promise of his peace. God encouraged them to fear not. He is still with them and his peace will keep them as they save him. Thank God in the midst of our trials and afflictions, in the midst of our labors and activities, in the excuse me, I still got a cold. In the midst 
of our feeble attempts to serve the Lord of glory. We have his presence and his peace to sustain us. John chapter 14 verse 27. The promise, the promise of his power. God, God um, reminds them that he is still in control, church, regardless of how things may, may look. God promised that it's still true today. It looks like evil in the world, and the world is out of control. It looks like Satan and, the, and his will are having their day. But I would not remain, remind, but I just remind you that we serve a God who is still on the throne. He still has all the power, and it's time we he will demonstrate his power and his sovereign over uh, over Satan, Satan and the world. The promise of his provision. Some people, church, were concerned about the expense of this, the project. Others was concerned about the new temple lack, the gold and the gliss of the first temple. God just reminds them that he has all they need. Church, friends, he still does. Don't despair that the mega, uh, that the mega churches with their contemporary music, freshly worship and lack of doctrine seem to be flourishing. God has not forsaken us. He knows what we need in, in these days and we will pr to protect the raiment and provide all that we need in his own time and in, in his own way. The beginning of, the, of his potential. These verses tells us, tells of a day when the desire of all nations come, will, would come. They tell of a day when the glory of this latter house will be greater than the former. He is, church, referring to the coming of Jesus. Years later, this new temple was remodeled by Herod and into and into that newly remodeled temple walked the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Lord came to the temple and fulfilled the words of Hagen. You see, he came to Solomon's temple in the glory cloud, but he walked into the temple in a fresh, in, in a flesh. What does that mean for us, church? Well, we look into the into with envy on the day when God moved in the great revival of yesterday. We can long for the old days, but the faith remains that we have a privilege that they did not that they did not enjoy. You see, Jesus did not come then to get his church. But he just might come in our day. So, as bad as things may look to us from time to time, church, let us remember that our Savior could come for his church at any time. If you ask me, that is something to get excited about. Friends, you can live your life looking back. You can live your life longing for what you think others have. Or you can seize the opportunity that God is giving you in these days. Do a work for him and watch him move in power. In that day, uh, the young men shouted while the old men wept. In our day, may we all recognize the fact that God is looking for a people who will seize the day for his glory. I can't go back to yesterday. I can't embrace everything that is being done in the name of, of religion. But I can seize the opportunity I have been given today. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. 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 Let me go to my power prayer book.
prayer without heart. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fever serving the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Prayer without burning enthusiasm does not help your situation because it has nothing to give. Prayer without enthusiasm has no heart. Heart, soul, and mind must find a place in real prayer. Heaven must be moved to feel the force of the crying unto God. Paul was a notable example of a man with a fevered spirit of prayer. His potential was all-consuming. It's certainly immovable upon the object of his desire and the God who was able to meet him. Dear God, I want to have the fevered spirit of Paul. Please guide me in your truth today. Amen. 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 If this message has been a blessing to you, find yourself a Bible-based church and become a part of the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen, 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 amen. God bless you. Thank you.